Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to talk briefly about transparency. So before we jump into the video, I would like to take a quick minute and thank the partners of the channel. The partners are the highest tier support both on YouTube and Patreon. And they are Caden Arslia, Gerboles Inc., Super Awesome, and Wen Shang. I'd also like to thank all the other fine folks that appear on the screen here. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. If you'd like to support the channel and support my work, feel free to have a look at the YouTube membership, or if you prefer Patreon, you can check out patreon.com slash Travis Vroman. So, in the last video, we left off not rendering our transparent objects, uh, and that is because uh, we actually had something in our world renderer, or our world view rather, that was explicitly leaving them out. Now, why would we have done this? Well, let's go ahead and get rid of this check and build and run. And this will essentially return us back to where we were before. So what we wind up with on occasion are really strange artifacts like what you see here with this plant. So you'll notice if you look closely that uh, in some cases uh, we can see through these leaves to the object behind it. And then in other cases we can sort of see where the actual geometry of the object is. And it's just rendering this dark blue, which is sort of the, um, the, the color of the background uh, when nothing's rendering. So if we look at the sky, it's that same dark blue. And so um, what we're actually seeing here is an artifact of transparency rendering, uh, specifically when you're using the depth buffer. And so what happens is it tries to render objects that are closest first and then it tends to um, render objects that are further away. And uh, the issue with this is that you can run into situations where the drawing order can actually be wrong, where um, the because the depth buffer sees that these pixels are um, out closer to the camera than these ones back here, it says, okay, well, we don't need to draw these ones back here because we're drawing this here. And so, um, this becomes a very complicated issue and still to this day one of the most complex issues um, and most expensive issues to actually solve when it comes to rendering. And so uh, there are several ways that you can solve this and we're going to take a look at one of those ways today. Um, and we are going to revisit this a few times as we go on because the way that I'm going to solve it isn't going to be um, 100%. Uh, but basically what we're going to do is we are going to separate out uh, all of the transparent objects um, within this scene from all the opaque objects. And we're going to force it basically to render all the opaque objects first and then render all of the transparent objects. However, there is another thing that can potentially happen. So when you're rendering multiple transparent objects, um, you can actually run into a situation where um, you can't see one object through the other. So in this case, uh, we look here, we see this transparent, these vines back here in the background, we can see through this object into those. But if we navigate the camera to this vine and try to look back down at that planter, uh, we can see that it's actually being clipped right here. And this again is because of the depth ordering that's going on. And so what we actually need to do as a first pass is we are going to put some logic in place to say, okay, how close are each of these objects to the camera? And then uh, render them in reverse order from that. So we'll render the further away objects first, and then we'll render the closer uh, transparent objects after that. Uh, and that's not a per perfect algorithm either, and we're going to see an example of why that is as well. Um, but it should give you an idea of uh, some of the complexities that are involved in uh, in solving this problem. So, like I said, uh, this is one way of solving this problem. Another way to solve this problem is you can technically discard um, transparent pixels in, in something like this, um, where you're just going to say, you know, don't 
don't actually render this abort um, abort rendering this transparent pixel here and then that will actually make um, the uh, pixel behind it actually render um, and that is certainly valid for plant life and that's probably what we're going to do at some point um, with that as well um, so what we're going to wind up with is probably a, a combination of several different methodologies of uh, transparency ordering and blending so enough about that let us jump into the code so i'm going to actually put this back because we are still going to need that so the, one of the first things we're going to need to do is actually uh, going to be in our um, kmath oops kmath uh yeah uh, and we're going to need to uh, actually create a a new function here um, and I'm thinking probably right after vector 3 distance before we start defining the vector 4 stuff uh, we're going to need to create a, a method that allows us to take in a vector 3 and a matrix 4 and transform uh, that vector 3 by the matrix and the reason that we're going to need this is because we are going to need to get the center point um, and extents of each piece of geometry within our scene. And in the case of our um, our individual uh, elements within the Sponza scene, those all have sort of a, a master transform, if you will, of uh, the ob overall meshes transform itself. And so we need to say, um, we need to take this uh, vector for a particular point um, and be able to transform it by the transformation mat matrix of, say, the sponge object. And so that will mean that our calculation will be, will be correct if we were to rotate the sponge scene. Um, it'll still be correct in in location to our camera or in, in re relation to our camera. So uh, the way that we do that is basically a simple uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, this looks like a lot of math, but really what's all that's happening here is we are uh, multiplying uh, the, all the, uh, the rows and columns of the, uh, the matrix by uh, the vector three, which we're treating as a one by four matrix. And uh, I say one by four matrix because we are using the vector X, vector Y, and vector Z. And then it's a fourth element, since we're dealing with positionals here, I'm hard coding that to 1.0. Um, another way that we might do this in the future is maybe put an additional property here as to what that W component should be for the vector three, um, because technically you can't really take a vector three and multiply it by a matrix four, that doesn't really work. It has to be uh, the, same, the same dimension. So uh, for right now, we're just using one for that, and I've put that in there explicitly um, that is basically the same as just, you know, doing uh, this, right? But I put it in there to be explicit, uh, so it's very clear as to what exactly is going on. So we're going to need that. And uh, we're going to need that because we are going to need to calculate uh, the center point of each individual object um, in all of our OBJ files or whatever meshes we happen to be importing. And uh, so in order to, uh, to do that, um, this is one of the things that we're gonna need. Uh, the other thing that I wanna do is in our defines.h, we have, uh, let's see, it was right around here. We have uh, an invalid ID um, for a 32-bit integer, 16-bit, um, and a 8-bit, uh, a but we don't actually have one for 64-bit. So I want to go ahead and just add that in here as well, just in case we need it. Uh, so that's been something I've been meaning to fix for a while. And I think uh, probably the next thing that we're going to do is we'll go into our math types. And we're going to go, um, we'll start all the way at the bottom. And I think right above our vertex 3D, but below our matrix 4, we're going to include two new data types. So we're going to have something that we call extents, and we're going to have a 2D and a 3D version of that. And basically all it provides is the 
minimum extents and maximum extents of an object, meaning uh, the minimum x value of all the vertices within an object and the maximum x value, and the same for y and z. So we're gonna have basically a minimum and a max that we can use to later uh, generate a bounding box, for example, when we need to figure out how big something is in space. Um, this allows us to sort of figure that out. And so uh, this is the three-dimensional version of that. This is the two-dimensional version of that. So we have that. And I guess the next thing that uh, we will need to do is probably we'll need to go into our resource types. And we're going to want to find uh, geometry. And we're going to want to add uh, that data to this. So we have um, our internal ID, our, uh, our generation, which by the way, that doesn't need to be 32 bits. 16 is enough. Um, 8-bit uh, might not be enough, but let's let's go ahead and cut that in half uh, because we're going to have lots of them. So um, we don't need that to be 32-bit. Uh, but we're also going to have uh, the center and the extents here. So we're going to calculate this for any geometry that we generate. Okay. So with that, we need the geometry system C needs a small update. Uh, so um, we have right around here. So we have our geometry ID, which is now 16 bit. Um, not the geometry ID, sorry, uh, the, the generation, this guy. So uh, I'm just gonna do a find on that real quick and uh, we're just gonna change this to U16. And set that to U16 and set that to U16. So I just did a find there. And next, I think uh, in the create geometry, uh, we'll go to this. Uh, we have here um, our acquisition of the new material, but uh, we don't actually have uh, any sort of way to to include our our center and our extents. So uh, those things are going to be provided by the configuration. So we'll have to update that here in a second. But basically, we're just going to copy them over, right? So um, in fact, actually, I think. The configuration already had those things. Yeah, so the configuration already had these things. Um, and so we just kind of were throwing them out and not really using them. Uh, so uh, here we're copying those things over. And down where we are generating our cube config. This is plain config. Uh, cube config is the only one we really care about for right now. So let's see, we want to go ahead and put that in here. So we've already figured out uh, the half width, uh, the min x, min, a, min, min x, min y, min z, max x, y, and z. We already have that data. So what we're gonna do is we are just going to copy that to our config min extents, max extents using the min values here, the max values here. And then our center is always going to be zero because we're generating this geometry. Um, it's not offset by any sort of um, amount. So uh, in this case, uh, we're always going to have zero for that, but it needs to be set regardless. So that is it for the geometry system. One more thing that we need to change is in our material system, we need to make a quick change to the apply global. So uh, right now um, we are taking basically the shader ID, uh, projection, view, color, um, and so forth. We need to add one more property to that, which is the frame number, uh, because we actually need to determine whether or not uh, it needs to be updated. Because if we have a um, or multiple uh, objects using the same uh, material system, and they go to apply global, it's actually gonna fail right now. So we need to actually fix that as well. 
So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add a comment for that. And back in here, go to the material system and apply global, add it here. And then uh, all what we should have to do is basically uh, come in here, very first thing, uh, and acquire our shader. Whoops. So we'll say uh, shader s equals shader system get by ID. And we'll pass a shader ID, which we already have. And now we can check the shaders globals. Um, first off, if we don't have a shader. Um, we want to return false, All right? Because that's no good. Uh, otherwise, um, if the uh, if the shader if the shader render frame number render frame number, which we do not have yet, um, is equal to the renderer frame number, whoops, frame number, then we're going to return true. And this is because we actually don't need to or want to do this stuff um, if we've already updated the shader this frame. So we're going to need to add this in just a second. Um, and then if not, down here, right before we return true, we need to sync the frame number, if I can spell. So um, we'll say uh, s uh, render frame number equals uh, render frame number. Okay, so we will uh, synchronize that. Um, that way, uh, we make sure to only update these globals uh, once. Uh, and I believe uh, that is all we actually have to do for the material system. Quick update, but a necessary one nonetheless. Uh, so I guess it probably makes sense to uh, go to the shader system. Um, shader system. And within the struct shader right here, uh, right before internal data, we are going to add that U64 uh, renderer frame number. Uh, let's just call it render frame number. And we will say uh, used to ensure the shaders globals are only updated once, once per frame. So that is definitely going to crash us um, if we go to use uh, the same material on more than one object. All right, uh, so we have that. Um, now in the shader system dot C, um, when we're invalidating all the shader IDs, uh, let's see, This is going to be in, yeah, in, uh, let's see, right here. Uh, we need to say state pointer shaders sub i dot render frame number. And we're going to set this to invalid ID U64. So that's where we're going to use that. And that will ensure um, that we uh, are always in sync. Uh, we don't start that at zero because zero is obviously the very the number of the very first frame that we're going to update. So um, that would mean that we don't update right away, um, and we would get errors from that. So um, we need to start this at a super high number and then loop around. Okay. So uh, that should fix the error in material system. So that is good to go. And I believe uh, most of the other work that needs to be done is in the views themselves. So um, what I'm going to do is I have a copy uh, 
let's see. So I have a copy of a new texture that I want to use. So let me just find it really quickly. Um, let's look here. And should have just done this in the terminal. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's see. Give me one second here. So we have uh, a new material. So I'm gonna go here to assets and let's just open the containing folder and just so that you guys can see that, I am going to go into uh, textures, assets, textures, and paste it here. So uh, this is just a, a really crappy graphic that I made uh, that is semi-transparent. Um, and it's transparent enough so that we can see like all the different uh, color channels and uh, how it bleeds through and stuff like that. So yes, it looks poopy, but um, it's going to give us what we need. All right. So um, what we're going to do with that texture is we are going to change our test material. And we're going to change the diffuse map name from orange lines 512 to transparent test. So that way uh, we load that up um, instead of uh, the orange texture. So that's gonna be placed on basically all of our, um, our cubes. Okay, so now we need to make a small change to the render view UI because uh, now we have the global that uh, now requires the extra parameter. So to this, we're gonna pass the frame number, which we already had anyway. And then we need to go into our uh, render view world and we need to do the same thing. So uh, let's see. Apply global. Uh, whoops. Frame number. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and build this real quick. All right. So uh, we have most of what we need uh, complete, or at least in place. Uh, but uh, this should help me at least sort of illustrate uh, the problem a little bit, a little bit better to you guys. So. Um, Let's see, uh, should I actually... You know what, before we actually do this, uh, there is one tiny little bug that I wanna fix. Um, in render view system.c, we need to include core k string. Um, because uh, when we are creating, uh, we want to do one more sanity check here, uh, which is probably, yeah, we can do it here. So we'll say if um, not config name or uh, string length config name uh, is less than one, uh, then we're going to say k error. Render view system creates name is required, um, and this is just a catch. Uh, it's a catch-all basically for when we go to configure these um, in a configuration file. If we forget to put the name, it's going to scream at us basically. Um, and then we need to make sure here to set the view name equal to string duplicate, because we don't know where that uh, pointer is owned. And we'll say config name. And since we are duplicating a string here, that causes an allocation. Uh, when we go ahead and, do we have a destroy for that? I don't think we actually do. 
So I'm not going to fix that right now. Um, oops, and that's a minus, not an equals. Uh, so I'm going to put a to-do here. Uh, leaking the name, create a destroy method, and kill this. Um, yeah, because we, we probably should be cleaning up that memory. Anyway, so that is that. We'll go ahead and launch. And this should let us see um, the problem a little bit more clearly. Oh, it won't because I forgot to actually turn transparent objects on. So, um, let me go back to the render world and the build packet. I'm going to disable this again. And build. Okay, and, well, that's really weird. Why are we not getting, uh -huh. okay. So this is actually even more different than what I was expecting. So uh, if you look really carefully as this cube passes us here, we can see this transparent cube through it. But what we're really seeing here is the blue background through this. So we're not seeing this as we would expect, even though it's transparent. But when we pass over this, we can see it. And the same is going to be true, I bet, with the little cube as it passes around. Yep. So the little cube also does the same thing. And that's because of the order that these are drawn in. right? So. Um, it is, it is definitely uh, not right, <laughs> because at this angle we should be able to uh, see through this um, in either direction to the other cube, right? And we can't see that at all. It's being completely occluded. So, what we need to do is we need to find a way to essentially uh, sort these by the dis their distance from the camera. So the way that I'm going to tackle this for now is we are going to define a new structure at the top here, and we're going to call this uh, geometry distance. And it's going to hold the geometry render data and a distance from the camera. And uh, we're going to basically queue these up and the list and sort the list. And we are going to sort that list using a quick sort method. Now I'm doing this in here because it's handling a array of this specific type and I don't feel like making this generic right now so I'm just going to do this within the view itself. Um, and there's there's plenty of uh, sorting algorithms that you can use for this. I'm going to use uh, quick sort because it is decently fast um, and it's, uh, you know, it's relatively simple to implement. So, um, with that, uh, I'm going to start on the build packet right here. So we're saying here, iterate all meshes and add them to the packets geometry collection. This is no longer true. So we're actually going to um, delete that. And instead, um, we're going to create this geometry distances DRA. And this is going to hold uh, geometries of that are uh, essentially transparent. And so what we're going to do is, uh, as we loop through each mesh, we are going to get the mat for model of that mesh, which is just going to be um, the uh, address of, uh, that's actually going to be a pointer to a mat for, right? Because we don't want to copy all that data. So we're going to say the address, the address of mesh data uh, meshes um, actually we don't even need to do that let's do instead let's do transform get world and here we will pass the address of uh, M which is our mesh uh, transform okay and why is that bleating
Yeah, okay, because it's not a pointer. That's fine. We'll just take a copy of it. It's fine for now. Um, we'll worry about the performance of this a little bit later because this is not the final uh, thing that we're going to use anyway. So this is just to kind of show you guys uh, one way of at least solving this problem. So um, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, I guess I could keep this. So, well, no, I'm going to remove that. And instead, uh, I'm going to create a uh, geometry render data here. And I'll call this render data. And I'll say render data dot geometry equals m geometries sub i, sub j rather, sorry, because I'm in the j loop here. Uh, and then uh, I will say render data dot model equals model. And what we're going to do with this render data varies. So if we are in a situation where we uh, actually have um, a non-transparent object, uh, we're going to get rid of these three lines because we've already done that, that stuff up here. And uh, instead, all we're going to do is we are going to perform this push. So uh, we actually want a comment in here that we had before, only add meshes with no transparency. So we're going to push that to the geometries and then increment the count. Otherwise, if we do have a material that has transparency, we're going to handle that a little bit differently. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slam all this in here at once. So for meshes with transparency, we're going to add them to our separate list here. Uh, so this is going to be um, our geometry distances. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the center of that geometry by calling the center, which would have been copied in from the config anyway. And we're going to pass it the model matrix. So we're going to transform the center of that piece of geometry by the model matrix. We're then going to get the distance from that center to the camera position that we have. So uh, we're going to say, how far away is that? then take both of those things. Um, so we're going to take the absolute uh, distance because uh, the distance technically could wind up being um, negative somehow. So we just want to make sure that um, that we're taking the absolute value of that just to be safe, just in case we, we wind up with any negatives or anything. Um, and uh, we're going to take that and uh, we're also going to um, save off the render data and then add it to that list. And we're going to process it afterwards. So after we have iterated all of our meshes and all of our geometries in there, then we will have already added uh, the meshes with no transparency, but we need to sort the meshes with transparency. And so uh, this is where we are going to sort the distances. So what we're going to do is before we return, we are going to say, um, first off, get the geometry count or the length of that array. And then we're going to call our quick sort, which we have not actually implemented yet. We're going to add them to the packet geometry once that array has been sorted uh, in the order that they're sorted, and then we'll return true. So uh, that's the usage code. So our quick sort is going to be relatively simple. Basically, we're going to compare distances and switch uh, elements of the array depending on which distance is greater or less than. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is we need to have a method for an in-place swap. So we pass a pointer to a geometry distance A and a pointer to a geometry distance B. We save off the value of A to a temporary variable. Then we set A equal to B, and then we set the value of B to temp. So it just does an in-place swap on that. The next thing that we have is we have a partition. And the partition basically takes a low index of the array, uh, of this array, takes the array, low index of the array, and the high index of the array, and whether or not to sort it in ascending or descending order. And then it basically is like a divide and, con a divide and conquer, rather. And so um, what it does is it uh, basically splits it in half at the high index, um, and then takes the low index minus one, loops through that array using those indices. And if it's ascending, it says, well, if the uh, distance uh, of our current element is less than the pivot distance, meaning uh, what we're comparing it to, 
then we just move, um, we increment the pointer, um, or we increment the i counter rather, and we call swap on array sub i and array sub j. Otherwise, if we are doing descending, which is this block here, we take the distance and we say, okay, is the distance greater than our pivot distance, right? Which is, remember, this guy. So if it is greater, then we basically do the same thing. And we say, okay, well, we want to increment the counter and then swap J and I. And then finally, um, once we've looped all of that, then we go ahead and we grab the array at the uh, I plus one and we swap it with the array at high index. And then we go ahead and we return the index, okay? And so this is a recursive, um, not recursive, that's not the word I want, but like uh, it's used recursively by its caller is what I'm trying to get at. Um, and so its caller is the quick sort. So what this does is it basically makes sure that the low index is less than the high index. So typically when we call quick sort, uh, we're going to be passing the low index as, uh, where is it? Up here. So the low index is going to be zero and the high index is basically going to be uh, the the last index of the array, which is going to be geometry count and minus one in this case. So it'll be the last index. So it's just going to make sure that that is the case and that you're not trying to do any out of order or weird sorting. And says, okay, if that's the case, then we're going to call partition first and basically split it in half. And then um, once we have the partition index, we will go ahead and quick sort each of those partitions. So um, we're going to sort the elements of the first half and sort the elements of the second half. And quick sort calls itself, so it basically keeps splitting in the half and sorting the half, the half, the half, the half. Um, and finally, you wind up with a sorted array. So eventually, this is something that I want to make generic, um, but for now, it was just easier to sort of implement it here. So with all that said, I believe that is actually everything that we need to implement for now. So let's go ahead and clean and rebuild. And we'll run. And now we should see something that looks a whole heck of a lot more correct. Okay, and so we now see that our transparent objects are rendering as we expect. So we can see all the boxes through one another um, no matter what order they're in, uh, given the camera's angle. Okay. We'll also see here that uh, it can be viewed through through this plant, right? So if I can actually position the camera here, we can see that our, our sorting is correct here. Now there are issues with this. This only applies to the entire mesh. So uh, as big as the actual mesh is, uh, or its center, is what is actually used to determine distance from the camera. So there can be situations where your distance from the camera from the center of the object is not enough to actually sort the individual faces of a piece of geometry correctly. So um, to illustrate what I mean, uh, if I go a little bit closer here and let's see, how do I need to set this up? I think if I look at it this way, where I'm past the center of this cube. We will see that it doesn't exactly see right there. So see how that's getting clipped. So it's not a, a perfect solution by any means, um, but it is a solution that works, right? It works for now. Um, and what we're gonna wind up doing is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of expensive to do these sorts every frame for every single object, as you can imagine. And so we're gonna need to rely on a few different techniques to sort these things properly um, and keep them sorted. And so there's a couple things we can do to optimize this. Um, we can hold onto the sorted order um, within the view as long as the view itself doesn't change. Um, and that would be one way of, of immediately reducing it. Um, however, every time you move the camera, it's gonna have to rechange that. And there's not really anything you can do to get around that. But uh, as I said, also, um, you know, sorting this way is, is one way of doing it. We can also use the discard method, um, which would also cause these things to render correctly um, without needing the transparency um, set. 
So for objects uh, that really have, you know, sort of hard transparent edges like this, that might be a better technique to use than something that is um, got, you know, translucency like what these cubes have. So um, this is just a quick look at one way uh, to handle transparency. And actually, uh, this is actually a really good example of, of uh, sort of the popping effect that you can get with this technique. So if you watch this cube as it comes around here, you'll see that this pops in and out of existence right there. So, um, you know, like I said, this technique is not perfect. It's one technique that we want to use, but if we switch this to a discard method, which we will be eventually um, exploring that as well, um, then we don't have to worry about uh, the sorting. So the sorting really should be used as a sort of last resort for, you know, glass type objects, things of that nature, um, and not used globally across the board. But for now, um, this is where we're going to leave transparency. So anyways, uh, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, uh, leave me a like on the video and a comment if you have any questions, those really help me out, uh, and I will see you guys in the next one.